All right, well, uh, really excited to be here. Um, I had thought about uh, talking here and had no idea that this dome would be so cool. I've got to get one for home so I can uh, watch some videos. I mean, this is fantastic. But, uh, well, I guess it's probably going to be hard to get that installed. But uh, I'll enjoy it while I'm here. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about working in harmony and, and how you can work together as a team uh, regarding workflows for content developers, or content creators, and developers. Um, I, I've been a developer. I've worked uh, as a front-end developer for many years. Uh, I've done some consulting. I've worked in management, uh, always around content management systems uh, in publishing, media, and advertising businesses. Um, so uh, a wide amount of experience working with different types of people, different roles. And um, uh, so I currently work at a, a place called WP Engine. We're a sponsor of the event today. Uh, really happy to be able to, to come out and, and be at the event that we're sponsoring. Um, so uh, the reason for this talk is I was on a call. And I, I'm going to back up one second and just, just so you, you know what WP Engine does. We're a managed host for, for WordPress, so a managed hosting platform. So we have uh, a, an office in uh, London that's newly opened. The company is based in Austin, Texas. We're about uh, five years old. We have uh, 300,000 customers, uh, uh, sorry, 300,000 installs, 30,000 customers across 120 countries. Um, so the, our, our London office where I work is, is newly created, and we're looking to expand our reach and to, to just meet the folks who use our, our platform, uh, and, and it's one of the reasons why we're here today. Um, so I was on a call as, as in my role as a solutions uh, consultant. So I, I, what I do is I, I work with uh, customers on, on solutions and making sure that they are in the right plan, that they are happy. And once they get on WP Engine, it's working for them. It's working well and helps them to scale and grow their business. Uh, so one, one afternoon, I was, I was on a call. And uh, it, it was a, a rather large US client. And they had an interesting mix of attendees on the call. So there was people from the business side, but there was a core team of developers and also a core team of content creators. Coming from a technical background, I approached the call as, what are the developers trying to do? And how are they looking to work with WP Engine? How, how are they looking to make their site work? And it was, uh, that's my typical approach is to look at the technical details and think about the integration and the site as a whole. Like, can this work? Can we do it? But there was another element to this call because we had the, the content editors on, on the phone as well. And what I, I realized at, at a certain point was that they're also looking to do the same thing as the developers are looking to do. So they're looking to structure a workflow that's, that's based around getting them to be productive a, as well and, and in a similar way as what the developers were looking to do. So I thought it was a really cool team and, and it was a great idea. Uh, sparked uh, a lot of thinking on my part. After that, I went and considered different ways on, in which you could do uh, a, a content workflow based around dev workflow. So that's really how we got to where we are today. Um, we'll talk about uh, a couple of things. Like I, I, I want to uh, j just um, talk about uh, the teams that you work with and, and just open up the definition of a team. We'll talk about how these teams can work together. And then I'll look into uh, dev tools, spend a, a significant amount of time on dev tools. We'll look into uh, deployment workflow. Um, and then, uh, uh, sorry, development workflow. And then I'll talk a little bit about deployment and how, how I've set this up. Um, and we'll talk about content workflow as well. Um, hoping that uh, there's some time I can demo a couple of things and then we'll leave some, uh, some time at the end for questions. I will post this on SlideShare, the presentation, the deck. So if you'd like to download it, uh, you can. And uh, my blog is edmundturbin.com. All right. Let's think about uh, who are the people on your team. So I've got a couple of colors going on here, because I, I think in regards to this talk, there are really two groups of people 
that, that we're, we're going to talk about. But that doesn't mean that your team isn't larger. And when I say team, I'm not talking about developers. I'm not talking about content creators. I'm talking about the group as a whole that works together to make something happen. So it's going to include your project managers, account managers, QA people, your client. Uh, but that's not always going to be the case. You're not always going to have these different types of roles. It depends on, on you, your, your, your uh, environment, your team, uh, the company, the, the ways of working. So these are, these are big variables. Um, so teams can be different, but, but for our purposes, working with WordPress, I think content and development are key. Um, the uh, idea that I have is that even if you are a single freelancer, you're not working alone. You have a client that you're working with. You have users that come to your site. So there's not really a way to be in a silo where, where you're working and, and, uh, uh, and just doing your own thing because it's really a website is going to be based around having other people come in and, and actually look at your site. Um, so it does make sense to set some best practices and workflow, workflow for developers and then also do the same for content creators. Um, so I'm going to dive into the, the developer side. I, I think that this audience is probably a bit more on the technical side. I've looked at some of the presentations that have gone on already and some of the, the presentations from this afternoon. And the things that I'll talk about will, will probably uh, be uh, explored in more depth than some of the other talks. So I'll be really just talking about high level uh, working around different systems, different tools. Um, so local dev is, uh, is really an essential thing as a developer. You're always going to want to work on a system that, that you can take that, that's mobile. Um, I'm really comfortable with my laptop as are many developers. It's just uh, the way of working. So. When you're looking at your laptop and, and trying to figure out how you can do your development, there, there's a couple of different options. Um, you, can, you, you really need to, to make it uh, work and install applications that are going to serve your pages. It's going to process your PHP. So uh, generally, you have PHP, Apache, MySQL, um, and, and potentially other applications that, that make your development stack work. So, I, I, for a long time, I was doing this at the OS level. I was maintaining my own PHP. I was installing uh, Apache, MySQL, and then updating them. And this was one approach that you could potentially take. Um, this worked for me when I was doing uh, freelancing. I was doing my own work. Um, there, was a, there was a day when I upgraded my OS, and suddenly everything stopped working. And I. I I took about uh, 24 hours, tried to figure out a way to get back on track working, and, and it was tough because I, I really had to evaluate what I was doing and why I was looking to, to work at the OS level. So I had my Mac, the operating system was updated, and now nothing works. So in order to be productive, I looked at other ways of doing things. So um, as, as far as the options that you have available today, um, MAMP is a solution that you can install locally. You can use Vagrant or Docker. So these are, are different systems and different ways of, of having your development environment on your local machine. So dig into MAMP for a second, because that's really the solution that I ended up using. Um, at MAMP was, uh, it's, it's essentially a, a, a one-click installer. You'll go through an install process. You'll be able to install it. And, and not to be biased, I, I should actually mention uh, XAMP and, and, and WAMP. And, uh, just uh, my point is that uh, using a system like that is, is the, um, uh, just wanted to, to talk about using an application that installs all of the development tools that you need. Uh, so for me, MAMP working on my local machine was great. I, I had ease of use. Uh, installing was simple. Um, a, a couple of things relies on your OS. So if I'm using MAMP and then there's another person on my team who's not using the same, uh, is, is not using a Mac, maybe there's a different uh, set of software, a different set of tools that that person uses. Um, so one of the issues that I came across when using MAMP was that when I tried to use tools from the command line, I tried to run a, a query for MySQL, I ended up actually using a different MySQL. So I was using the, the OS version of MySQL. And 
of course, you can configure that with, uh, with your path, and you can set it so that it does work. But there's some configuration there that, that you'd have to do. And, and at times, that was frustrating when I just wanted to dig into it and, and make it work. Um, so after some time, I looked at Vagrant. And uh, it took me uh, a while to wrap my head around ha how to work with Vagrant and, and how to, to get things running. A Vagrant is essentially a, a virtual machine. So you're, it's, it's a scripted install of a virtual machine. Allows you to, to go ahead and take a, a complete operating system that's configured with all the tools that you need and keep it locally. So this made a lot of sense to me. And I thought when I was working in a team, it really makes sense to have this mirror your production environment, have the same tools as you would have uh, on your servers, but also have all of your developers on the same install. Um, so really easy to set up once you once you sort of get the the basics once you install some of the the software dependencies and requirements. Uh, Vagrant up will get your your local machine running, and uh, I found it really a, a great way to work. Um, and and again, this is this is a way that you can really have everyone looking at the same system. The problem of well, it works on my machine, uh, but it doesn't work on production. It's, it would be completely avoided because you're all on the same system. Another way of working is uh, Docker. So you could install Docker, which is using a different paradigm of uh, a, a virtual machine. Uh, you're essentially using a container. And a container is uh, at the application level. So you create a container that has all of the, the tools like PHP, MySQL, Apache and, and whatever else that you would need to, to run your WordPress site. And then that container runs on a virtual machine, but uh, you can run many different containers on the same OS. So rather than a Vagrant, if you wanted to create another Vagrant box, it would literally be another copy of another OS running locally. All right, cool. So let's get into some of the dev tools and, and some of the reasons why, why we want to use uh, the, the same stack of dev tools across our, our team. Um, what I like to do is have the, the same tools, the same plugins uh, for, for my sites. When I create a new site, I always want to have a, a starting point or a template. So I, I think it's important to define the, the things that you use and, and then also have your developers working in that same environment, and also define the way of working, the way that you interact and, and actually get your development done. The plugins that I find useful are, are uh, debug bar, debug tools, uh, environment indicator, which is something that I'll, I'll show you a little bit later on. Um, for a lot of my work, I, I work on the theming side of things. So demo data creator is really important to be able to populate uh, a post or, or a page with some content that's similar to, to what a, a, an actual uh, editor would add. And then when working with roles, uh, user switching is super important just so I don't have to log out. I can see what a user actually does. I can troubleshoot any, any uh, permissions or access issues. Um, when you're working on your local machine, uh, there, there are a couple of things. That, so, so we've got the local dev environment. So we've sort of nailed that down. It, it's, it's Vagrant, it's MAP, or whatever you feel comfortable with. There's also other tools that you would install on your local machine to interact with, with that install. So a couple of the ones that I prefer and I found really useful are GitFlow. And GitFlow is a way of managing the way that your, your uh, Git repository branches and, and the way that uh, your team works uh, uh, as far as Git goes. Um, WPCLI is extremely useful for getting things done without having to go into WordPress, avoiding the dashboard. If you just want to turn a plugin on or you just want to change your theme, uh, quite an easy way and, and a very robust functionality based in WPCLI. Uh, in order to, to go in and, and make changes. Um, I, uh, I've overlooked this one uh, for a really, really long time. And I think as, uh, as you have a situation that comes up where you make a change and, and something doesn't work out, something goes wrong, really important to have a local backup. So a full backup, your database, your files, so that you can go back and, and just get back to work. Um, 
so uh, I've I've used uh, uh, just a, a local backup uh, uh, plugin that will run on a schedule once daily, keep the backups for seven days, and and that seems to be a, a really good thing. Um, another thing you'd really want to define is how how you're looking at content, how your developers are looking at at the content as your site grows and and as the site progresses. So it's important to have a uh, just a schedule around bringing content down from production so that if it's important for developers to see current content, then they can actually have that. All right, so sometimes as developers, we find ourselves doing things that are repetitive. We're doing the same things over and over again. That's the nature of software development is that we're, we're doing things that happen again and again. Um, so, Automation is a technique that you can use to, to make it easier to go through these things which you know are repetitive. And it's really helpful to take a look at your, what you do when you're working and understand if there's things that you go through and say, well, I do these seven steps all the time just so I can have this result. Um, so typical uh, things that you'd want to automate would be uh, your SAS compiling and minification. So for front-end development, uh, workflow would, would look something like this. So you'd have your, you would, you'd make a change to your SAS file. You would compile, then minify, create your CSS files, and then have your browser reload. So all of those steps, if I had to do that every single time I made a change to, to a, a SAS file, I think I'd go pretty mad. Um, but having that automated will save time, save energy, and just allow you to focus on what you're doing rather than the, the technical aspects of it. All right. So code management is, is extremely important for working with a group of developers. We're going to want a way that we can all have the same code, we can work on it, and then branch it back together. So if you've got more than one dev on a project, you, you probably want to make sure that that code works together. So I, I use Git. I think uh, Git is a, a really great tool just for, for versioning and, and just keeping track of your changes. Um, I, a typical workflow with Git, if you wanted to be very simple about it, you could set up a few branches. A, a master branch, which is, is really the, the final code. You can take your master branch, take a copy of that, uh, create it as a staging branch, and then create a, another copy of master, make changes to that, call it your feature branch, make a, a, a bug fix or a new feature, and merge that back into staging. You can test your staging branch before it goes onto a production environment. You can have your staging deployed to uh, a tier, uh, a, a server, where it's not publicly accessible or it's, it's not your main website. And then you can, you can go and push that to your, your production uh, website through the master branch. Once that is approved, it's working, and it's good. So Git flow uh, creates a little bit of a structure behind that. So I think with the, uh, a, just a simple Git uh, workflow without Git flow, what happens is you have a lot of freedom and it doesn't really give you uh, the amount of structure that um, it's helpful for, for a larger team. So what GitFlow does is takes a copy of your, your master, your master branch, and it creates a, a develop branch. And develop branch is where all of your developers will actually work. They'll push their changes into develop. Develop is, is essentially your, your working branch, and master is, is more the final branch. Um, when you're working with GitFlow, you'll create a feature branch. A, a feature branch is essentially any change that you're doing, any, any uh, uh, a small project, a small change. You can work on your feature. You can merge that back into develop. Once you have code in develop and everyone's happy, you can create a release. So you publish your feature into develop, and then from develop, you create a release. A release is a single point in time where the code is together, it's working, you can test that release on a, a, another production environment. And then you can publish the release, which splits it out to develop and master. 
There's another aspect of Git flow that's really helpful, which is a hotfix. So you can take a, a, a change from your master branch, so from your working production site, uh, and then then make a, a, a fix to to any problems that that may happen. What what um, it's important to know about that is that your develop branch is probably not going to be in sync with your master branch. So the hotfix allows you to go to what's current and then fix your cha change your your problem and then merge it back into your master branch. All right. So I wanted to talk about dependency management. <coughs> Excuse me. So what is dependency management? Um, when we're dealing with different plugins, different uh, themes, uh, different applications, there's going to be requirements. And we generally see this as, well, this plugin requires a, another plugin, potentially, or a, a certain version of PHP, or this theme needs a, a certain plugin to work, or a, a certain application. Um, so dependency management allows you to keep track of these dependencies and also automate them. So I spent some time looking at Composer, and I, I found it to be really interesting and, and um, just a, a, a cool way to go in and keep track of some of these things that I wanted to do. Uh, so I'm, I'm using Composer to create a, a essentially a templated install of WordPress. So I can have all of my themes, plugins, WordPress core, uh, and do some modifications using Composer. So the benefit of using a system like Composer is that all of your versions are, uh, all of your, your plugins are in sync for your team. So everyone is using the same set of software and they're able to, to go ahead and update at once. So if there is an update, you could run that and then, then have your team run the update as well. So it's just a way to keep things in sync so that there aren't versions, uh, version issues between uh, incompatibilities with different plugins that you're using. There is a, a system called uh, WPackagist, so WordPress Packagist. Packagist is a mirror of the WordPress repository. So it's got a copy of all of the themes, all the plugins, and WordPress core that use uh, a, a composer.json file. Composer uses a, a main file called composer.json, and that's really the, the main difference between uh, WPackagist and the standard repo. So WPackagist is looking for any plugin, any theme that's got composer.json, and allows you to, to install these packages through Composer. Um, <clears throat> so this is something that if we have some time at the end, I'd like to show you what I've created as, as far as my, my Composer flow goes. Uh, it's just... Uh, for me, really uh, amazing to see that uh, it can happen so quickly and be such a useful thing. So the idea here is for, for the, the template to be, you would distribute your composer JSON file to your, de your dev team, and the devs would run a simple command, composer install, and it would go and automate that install and create all of the files that you need to get started working uh, in your WordPress site. Cool, so dev workflow. Um, we I sort of touched on on stage and production and and local, um, and I, I guess uh, I wanted to talk about production tiers and why you'd want to use them. So, probably the the biggest reason for working in tiers is that you want to have a site that's stable in production, that you know is not going to go down if there are simple changes. Uh, I think there's as a developer. Uh, I've made mistakes where something happens and it affects the main site. So to avoid that, we can test our changes on a different tier. We can use a staging tier to schedule our, our changes. We can have all of our features, bug fixes tested before they actually get pushed to a production system. Um, and we can also make sure that if there are certain, certain groups of people that depend on a tier being available, that it won't be affected by changes. So an example is a staging site where content creators are working. Uh, allow that, that tier to not be affected by any dev uh, uh, pushes. So you would push to an environment called dev, do your development testing, 
and then only push to staging when, when an actual release happens. So this way, the content creator workflow can be maintained. They can do what they need to do without being affected by, by any bugs or any problems uh, with the, um, uh, the development branch. Uh, typical tiers are going to be a production stage local. Uh, this is really open. This is not something that is, is defined. You can go ahead and uh, change these. It doesn't have to be three tiers. It can be more. And this really reflects the team, the organization that you're working with. Um, uh, this is my, my workflow now. This is my, my tiers. I've set up a local dev environment using uh, Mercury Vagrant. Uh, my staging site uh, is uh, something that I use for previewing content. I'll do all my content work on staging, and then I will push to production uh, when it's actually ready. So this is uh, just a, a, a screenshot of my site. I've got a green bar at the top. And what that is, it's an environment indicator. So it's, it's actually a, uh, it, it's just a plugin that allows you to differentiate between your different tiers. So my production tier is green. My staging tier is yellow. My dev tier is red. So whenever I see green and I'm working on it, I'm extremely careful not to change anything. And in fact, I'm almost never working on, on the, the uh, production environment. So when I look at production, I'm generally checking to see if things are live. Did my deployment work? Am I able to, to see my changes? All right, we'll jump into uh, deployment for a second. I'm not going to focus too much on, on deployment, but I, I just wanted to explain how I've set things up, and I think it's, uh, it's really interesting. It's just been something cool to, to be able to make happen. Um, so I wanted to, to share that with the, with the group here. Um, so really, you're going to want to take your repository. You're working uh, locally uh, with your, your sites and version control. You're going to want to push that, those changes to a central place. So uh, a repository that everyone has access to is critical. So we use things like GitHub and Bitbucket. Um, so the advantages of using a, a repository service like that is that you, you have more than just access to a repository. You may have uh, the ability to manage your users. You can set who, does, uh, who has access to what project. And it really depends on how your project is working. So I've, I've made an assumption here that at, up until this point that we were working with a team of developers that is in one place working for, for one organization. That's not necessarily going to be the case. And it's, it's uh, it's entirely possible for in an open source project for somebody to take the code, make a change, and want to contribute that back into your your main code. Uh, so with uh, a service like uh, uh, GitHub, you're able to to do a, a pull request, so you can merge that code into your branch when it's, it's been worked on com completely independent of your dev cycle and your dev workflow. Um, so one of the things that you can also do with a service like GitHub is integrate with uh, a deployment technology to push to multiple servers. So ideally, you would push to production and you would say, I, well, I don't want to have staging be out of sync with production because then the editors are not going to see the, the code that's been changed. So you would push to production and staging at the same time. So I've taken uh, GitHub. So I can work with other developers. I can share my code. They can, they can download the code and work on a, a feature. Um, I'm using a, a, a service called uh, CodeShip. And CodeShip does the deployment and, and actually will push from GitHub to my main site. I probably just scratched the surface of CodeShip. And of course, there are other services that you could use, like DeployBot and, and tons of others, which would give you the, the same type of functionality. Um, CodeShip is, is probably uh, quite a complex thing that, that you could really work into a, a very custom CI, uh, a continuous integration and testing utility. Um, but for me, that, that's not a, a huge concern. I, I run a single blog, and it, it's, it's pretty low key. It's probably overkill. So, uh, but I do think that it's, it's an incredible way to, to have your, your code actually pushed out to your production environment. 
All right, so I've really, really focused on content workflow, uh, on development workflow. So I wanted to, to just uh, switch back to the working as a team part and how we can integrate our, our content workflow as well. If you think about it, content developers or content editors are doing the same thing. They're, they're working on their machine. They're doing their editing. Maybe they use uh, Word to create their documents. They copy that code into WordPress. So if they're given a staging server where they can work, add their content in, have an approval uh, process, maybe there is an editorial review, somebody has to approve their, uh, their, their work before it goes live, and maybe there are statuses that, such as needs review or ready for release. Um, all of that can be done on staging. And a good utility to do that is, is using Edaflow. Edaflow is a, a, a plugin, probably the most popular way that you can manage an, an editorial workflow. Um, so that said, it's really not that different than the dev workflow. You have one place where, where you really want to work together, and you never want to work on a, a production site. You don't want to have content that's done on production and then changed on staging. What happens is you can overwrite those changes and have no really good way to track what's going on. So I thought about how, how do I stage content? How do I make it so that I, I can keep content separate and make it so that content editors can work and, and have the benefit of a tiered workflow? The first thing that I did was export my content. So I did some work locally. I did uh, a, uh, an export and imported it into, into my site. That's fine. It works. Um, <clears throat> I think it's probably not the, the smoothest approach uh, as far as uh, getting content onto a different tier. So I looked around for some other ways to do it. Uh, and do a raw DB uh, export, probably a little bit more technical than our editors are, are willing to, uh, to dive into. And then there's some database management plugins which will actually copy your database and copy tables over. And I think, again, that's probably a little bit too complex. So we, do, we don't want to put the onus on the editor to have to do a whole bunch of technical steps. Um, so I looked into some content deployment plugins and systems, and there are a couple out there that are really cool, uh, a few that you would uh, pay for. Um, and there are some backup plugins as well, which will we'll do copying across tiers, uh, which, which may be useful. Um, and some platforms and hosts will actually have a copy from staging to live and back and forth. So there, there are really a, a couple of different approaches on how you'd want to stage your content. What I settled on is probably the simplest way to do this. And I used a, a, a plugin called content, content Staging. So Content Staging allows you to, to just deploy your changes. So once you make a change on your uh, staging site, you can deploy that to production. It doesn't do everything. Um, I, I have a wish list of, of things that I want it to do. And there are probably other things out there that, uh, that, that handle some more advanced functionality. Um, but what it does do is allows you to push a group of content in a batch. And I think that's really useful because you can have content pushed out in stages. You can schedule a, a content release so a number of articles can go live at the same time, a number of posts can go, go live. Um, it does a pre-flight check, which essentially verifies that you can push the content and the, 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 uh, the technical side, the connection is working. Um, and you can also you can you can you're not limited to pages and posts. You can uh, you can push custom post types, and it will uh, will also uh, push any media that's or attachments to your post. What I would want it to do is have a history, an audit trail, where I could see who actually did the push, who who made who pushed that content up, so I can go back and say, well. We, we didn't authorize this change or there was a problem. Now we need to change it just to understand what happened. Um, <clears throat> the, the problem with deployment is that if you, if you have a, a change that's made on staging and it's pushed to your production environment, while somebody has done work on production, you'll absolutely overwrite those changes. So there, there is a, a good case to have a two-way sync where you could actually push and pull content uh, into staging. Um, and another thing I'd really want to use is a multi-tier deploy. So if I was able to push, let, let's say I'm working um, 
with a, a, a QA team that needs to see the, the same content uh, that's on a, a different tier. I would push to two tiers at the same time. Uh, it's also would be really useful for if you wanted to pull down the live content to your dev, to your dev team so that th they could have the same content um, that is on the live site. Um, so as far as best practices with content goes, I think, I mean, just want to, to really just stress that we'll probably never want to be working on production, and that goes for, for dev as well as content. We don't want to make content so, uh, changes on, on a live site. There's just a ton of problems that could potentially happen there. Um, staging is, is a place where you can use your, your editorial review process can happen. Uh, and, and I think that it's good to isolate that and, and give staging uh, a, a good place uh, where, where it can be on its own and, and work independently uh, without uh, development affecting the, the staging workflow. And, uh, and then the, the other best practice, I would say, is, is make sure you, you're able to push that content and actually get it across to the next tier using uh, some type of deployment when the content is ready. Um, so I, I do have some time here for questions, but I also had a couple of things I wanted to show off uh, around uh, the uh, different tiers, uh, uh, my, my environment indicator, as well as uh, my composer workflow. Um, so let me, let me jump into that if we have some time, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll uh, take some questions. Um, not cool. Just give me a second. I'm going to try to uh, switch my screen perhaps here. A bit different right now. Okay. It looks like we can see this. Um, I'm just going to get to the, the top of this uh, composer JSON file. Just talk through what this does. I know it's it's a little ugly. It's code, it's, um, but I think it's it does a couple of things. Um, and it's really cool. So the top section, you've got a bunch of essentially metadata. It's it's about what what this project is about, what it's doing, <clears throat> author information, license, not incredibly important. Your repository section. You've got a, a, a link to packages. So packages is, is that repository for composer packages. Uh, so I want to use all of the, the WordPress plugins and themes that are available. So I'm adding that in as a repo. I also want to use the Sage theme, which is not in, uh, in uh, packages. So you, you have the ability to pull things into Composer using different methods. So it doesn't have to be in W packages. You can use something, uh, you can use a, a Git repository and, and several other methods for pulling your code in. So we've got those two sources as my repositories. I've got a couple of plugins that I like to use. So I've got the debug bar, debug objects. I've got the core of WordPress, and I've got the, the Sage theme that gets installed. I have an extra uh, section here which, uh, which takes my WordPress core and puts it into a directory called WP. I have some paths that set up uh, that, that put my plugins and themes into the correct directories once they're installed. And I've done a, a post install uh, script here. What's really interesting about uh, Composer is the, the the post install can actually take commands. So any, any command that you could issue on the command line, you could essentially use to script. So what I've done here is I've copied my index from the, the WP directory out into the root directory, and I've also created a, a new version of the config file. 
have used sed to go in and uh, uh, add some configuration to the, the WP config. So if I do have a connection, this could potentially work. I, uh, I'm not getting my input. Oh, there's awesome. Um, so just just to show you what's going on here. So I've got this composer JSON file, literally what we looked at in an empty directory. And so what I would do is I would run it and say composer install. And it's going to go through that config and actually download all of the packages and all the things that you need, do all of that um, uh, configuration for you. So don't know how long this one is going to take. It's probably chugging along. Maybe we can come back to it and see what the, the output looks like in the end. Um, but that, that's something that I think is an incredibly useful and, uh, and just a, a really cool thing that you can do in a, with your, your team is set this standard install to work with. So you can see it's, it's gone on to uh, installing the core of WordPress. I'm installing the stage theme. And then it will do those modifications uh, soon after all of those, uh, um, the plugins and theme are installed, uh, like creating the uh, config and moving the directories around. Um, cool. So I just want to take a look at content deployment. Um, just I've added a, a new file into my repo. I'm going to say uh, so I've committed and I will say git push origin master. So I'm pushing my repository, I'm pushing my change up to my origin, which is GitHub, and from GitHub that will get deployed uh, via code chip. Uh, no. Not sure what I did wrong there, but it's actually worked. Um, so I'm going to switch to my browser, and I've got this little indicator here that tells me what's going on. You can see in, the, in, uh, in CodeShip, it's actually working on that deployment now. So once it's actually deployed, this will change to a green circle. And I'll know that my empty file is actually on my production site. And the, the other thing that I wanted to show you was my environment indica indicator. So I've taken this plugin, which does a staging version of the environment indicator. I've just really changed the, the theme so that I've got a, a CSS file that works for production and local. So in this way, I, I can just I can see what, what I'm doing, where I am. Um, there we go. So we can see. We, uh, you can almost see. Sorry, it's a little bit cut off there, but there was a message from CodeShip that said it, our, the file was added successfully. Um, so I, I think the last thing that I, I would want to do is just deploy to production. So I've got my content in staging. I've created an article ahead of time. I am going to deploy to production. So it does the pre-flight check. It says that it's good, and I'm going to deploy my batch. And if you wanted to, you could actually deploy more than one piece of content. And it looks good. It's showing us a link to working in Harmony. And this is now on my production site. So I've deployed that from staging. All right. 
let's open it up for questions. And, um, and uh, I guess we've got about five minutes. And uh, you guys look hungry. I think it's time for lunch. So uh, what are we thinking? What questions do we have? A little bit, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and of course, there's there's several different ways that you can do your your content, uh, you know, pushing and deployment. So, ramp, yeah. I I have tried it, and I think that's the system that I like the most. But but I don't have a, a license for it. So, can you repeat the question? Uh, question was: Have I tried uh, Version Press, and have I tried Ramp? Um, both systems for pushing content to uh, uh, from uh, from staging or across tiers, and yeah, they're they're both really uh, good solutions. I I think definitely recommend uh, uh, you know seeing if they work for you. I think that for me, Ramp was the best. It's it's a, a more fully fleshed out system. Um, I just think we're really early on in this process, and and it's it's not uh, it doesn't work perfectly, and there there's still some changes and advancements that that can be made around uh, deploying content. Okay, first, thank you for the presentation. I thought oh, yeah. it was very good. You're welcome, thanks. Um, you talked a little bit about, uh, a little bit about uh, Docker and Vagrant. Do you have a preference? Yeah, I, I just don't know too much about Docker and how I can work with it uh, with WordPress. I know that you can get uh, WordPress containers, and there is a, there's a whole world there that I need to get into. Right now, it's, it's Vagrant, and uh, you know, there's several different Vagrant boxes that you can use. What I started working with is uh, Mercury Vagrant, which is a it's an actual version of uh, WP Engine software stack, which includes HHVM and uh, PHP as well as a fallback. Um, so that's really interesting. That's similar to the the server that I work on. So I like to to have that sort of line up and and be you know the same system as much as possible. Right. So you talked about having the same tools in the, in the team. Do you mean like IDs and stuff like that as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that, I mean, maybe that's going too far. Um, I think it's great if you, you are really, if you have a preference for Sublime maybe, or, you know, something that, that works well and, and maybe you've done more than just used it, uh, as an IDE. Um, uh, for me, I've worked in a, a bunch of different IDEs. Uh, right now it's Sublime. I was looking at PHP Storm for a bit too. I liked it. Uh, I found it really flexible, but, uh, to be honest, I, I don't have a preference. All right, so it's more like server tools and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I think that that uh, you know, developers probably have their choice of what they want to use as well. So, yeah, right. And, and I'm open to that. Uh, and also, you talked a little about this uh, stage content uh, problem, where uh, the, the problem is isn't most of the time when you're staging a new server. It's when you have to update uh, stuff from a production server. Do you have a strategy for that today that you didn't? Do you mean pulling down content from production to staging? Yeah. Well, the other way around, when, when, you're, when you're working with content on the staging server and you want to update that on the production server, yeah. when, when it's a new site, it's, it's not a problem. But when you have a production site, you, you, the production keeps on getting new content. Yeah. Um, so, right. So on, when you're working with content staging, the plugin that I showed you, it will overwrite any changes. So if, if you have something on production and it, it's an existing article, it will actually literally just add the, the you know, new content in, into it. Overwrite, not, not merge, not, not add, but, but yeah. literally so, yes. overwrite. So, so do you have a, a, st a strategy to get around the problem? Uh, yeah. The only thing is that you could potentially do is two-way sync, and I don't think we're quite there yet. I, I think right. that Ramp does two-way sync. I don't know that it's actually supported by by Ramp. I, I, I think it functionally works, but it's probably a technically hard thing to implement. Right. And just a note, I, I watched that when you try to push the first time. You oh, yeah, what I do? Push, you push the up key, to uh, so you commit <laughs> it twice instead of pushing. Uh -huh. So that's OK. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a few composer questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, when you uh, 
do you use the update functionality in Composer 2? Because when you, uh, the install script will overwrite the uh, local files, you can modify them. Uh, how do you deal with that if you, for example, have like a configuration file and uh, stuff like that? Yeah, exactly. So if you did run that update, it's it's going to literally do everything over again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you can do a script for on update. Um, uh, let's see if I can just jump back into it quickly. Ah, so this is the output. So this is what it looks like when it's finished uh, installing. Um, so just... Just looking at my uh, install for a second. At the bottom, there's a, a post install command. You can do a post update or or an update command. So so in the script section, you can you can add there. There are a bunch of different uh, things that you can do there. Okay. Uh, and um, another question: the in Composer, you have the autoload functionality. So when you add uh, use uh, PSR loading. Uh, does the uh, VP packages utilize PSR auto loading or no? no. Not quite sure no. on that one. Okay. Uh, if you add, uh, <laughs> of course, it doesn't. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, if you add normal composer dependencies, uh, like uh, carbon date functionality, for example, uh, where where do you um, <laughs> put that? the outloading for the normal vendor. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can, so you can add an installer path and you can put it wherever you want to. And that's, that's essentially what I've done with the plugin. So it doesn't have to live in vendor, it can go somewhere else yeah. and then, then you can have that auto-loaded. Okay, um, yeah, that's, that's all. Great, thank you. Hi, uh, I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, when you push, uh, say, content from stage to uh, to live, would it be possible, for example, to push the new content as a revision of previous content? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so you uh, do you mean track the revisions? Yeah. And I, I mean, if you have revisions on on staging, you're you're essentially using that as your system of record. Mm -hmm. So you could switch your revision back to you know a, an earlier version and then push that up, mm -hmm. and it, it literally just overwrites. Okay, cool. So that it's a good way to manage it. I, I, you know, I didn't talk too much about revisions and the sort of built-in workflow for, for content in, in WordPress, but, but yeah, definitely works. Awesome, thanks. Any more questions? It's hard to see in this room. No? Well... A big applause and thank you for this presentation. All right, thank you guys. Pleasure to talk to you.